Well, welcome to another segment of the Grassy Knoll. <clears throat> it is February 19th, 2007, and you're going to get a pre-record that was done just yesterday with Dave McGowan. We're going to be talking about his book, Program to Kill, and um, the history of serial killers, or at least the most recent uh, few decades of such, where it might have been uh, not necessarily a... Uh, sporadic or uh, organic thing, if you will. Uh, I guess I got hacked during the weekend, and, uh, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, it was more like somebody was in there being a poltergeist and moving furniture around, if you know what I mean. Uh, shows disappeared. Uh, in fact, one is still gone. It is the uh, Chapman show, but it's on the server. See, I mean, whatever they did, they did just to, uh, to the website. The audio is on the server, and if you want to hit the Chapman show, uh, and you can see from the, all the other uh, links on the audio page, they, they go by, uh, obviously, a certain pattern. You can pretty much guess sometimes, uh, if you don't see what's there, that, in fact, uh, uh, you can hit it. So with this one, of course, it would be visigoth.com slash audio slash Chapman 2 hyphen 9 hyphen 07. Dot mp3, right? Chapman's name, Chapman 2 hyphen 9 hyphen 07 dot mp3, and you'll be able to get chappy. All right, so anyway, I don't know what that was about. It could have been a lot worse. We'll see if it happens a second time. I don't know if this is a warning or something like that, you know, because of what we've been doing. Or it could be just a coincidence, honestly. It could be that. So we'll see uh, what transpires, and uh, that I think will tell all. In the meantime, meantime, I still can't breathe, so bear with me. Uh, we got Dave McGowan for it, and we'll have him back again tomorrow. Uh, we are taping this on Sunday, February 18th for Play Today, Monday the 19th. We have with us Dave McGowan. Uh, the website, by the way, if you want to check it out while you're listening, is www.davesweb.cnchost.com. You can hit that also from my website, either the upcoming shows or his audio, which will be archived um, right after uh, you hear this. Uh, he's the uh, author of three books, um, uh, pro uh, pro Program the Kill, get it out there, bro, uh, Learning the F Word and Derailing Democracy, and it's about Program to Kill uh, that we're going to uh, speak to today. And so, uh, uh, Dave, thanks very much for joining us uh, out there on the left coast, huh? <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me. Well, it's been a long time, and, you know, Serious is a heart attack. Uh, folks have said to me time and time again, why don't you, why don't you, how come you haven't had you on? And you know what? They're right. And, and so anyway, that, uh, that time has uh, passed us, and you're here, and I'm glad that you are. Again, you've uh, agreed to be on tomorrow also to talk about another subject. But with Program to Kill, and it deals with the nature of, I guess, serial killers. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you know, down in Florida, as you well know, uh, they've had their share. Uh, one was just put that uh, put to death recently. But uh, from your take, are you seeing this as something also that I hate to say it? I mean, it may not be the best term for it. But is this also kind of weaponry uh, uh, that is somewhat unleashed against the, the population? Uh, yeah. What's going on there? I see it very much as uh, as being that. Yeah, it's, uh, I see it as being basically. Um I guess you could say a uh, psychological warfare tactic, very much, uh, very much along the lines that uh, terrorism is, is used. In that, uh, it's a, a vehicle of sorts for instilling fear in people. And uh, as it becomes, as it's become more and more apparent, you know, over particularly over the last several years. Uh, it's all about control through fear. I mean, that's that's the basic operating principle of our government and uh, most other governments as well. Uh, you strike enough fear into people, and they're going to run to Big Brother for protection. You know, I mean, we see that with uh, terrorism now. That's, uh, you know, uh, alleged terrorism anyway. And uh, before that, and and, and still. Uh, the serial killers play play very much the same role. I mean, very few things strike fear into people's hearts uh, the way that serial killers do. You know, so yeah, I think it's um, it's it's very much sort of a created phenomenon that that is used as a uh, vehicle for social control. Was there an event? Was there a particular um, individual uh, who uh, obviously had a reign of terror? 
uh, that finally made you uh, want to take a look into this? Because this is not a very pleasant subject, no doubt about it. I mean, it's it's as you know abysmal as a, a you know Nietzschean uh, event. But uh, was there something that happened out there that made you finally say, you know what, I, I want to take a look at this? Yeah, yeah, there was actually. Um, it, it kind of arose, and we talked a little bit about this, you know, uh, off the air. It kind of arose, grew out of um, a uh, something that I discovered while researching my second book, which you uh, mentioned in your intro, the uh, Understanding the F Word book, which was that um, George Bush, and very few people realize this. Um, what what they do realize is that he was like the uh, the governor. Uh, he he basically put uh, green lighted more executions during his tenure as governor of Texas than any governor in any state in the in the history of the union. I mean, he is the America's premier hanging governor, so to speak. <laughs> um, and people people uh, do know that, but what they don't know is that he actually did issue one pardon, one and only one pardon, out of the, I think, 153 cases that crossed his desk as governor, and that was for uh, a gentleman by the name of Henry Lee Lewis, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a guy who at various times confessed to up to like 600 of the most brutal, horrendous serial killings imaginable, you know, complete with cannibalism, necrophilia, torture, mutilation, you know, all the all the standard things that you find in these cases. And yet out of all the people who came before George Bush to have their cases reviewed, he was the only one granted a pardon. And uh, that definitely piqued my interest. Mm. In, uh, and I included that in the book, and I got uh, a lot of feedback on that from people who said, well, why would he do that? Well, you know, what you have a theory about about why he would have done that. And at the time, I really didn't. So I decided to look into it, and uh, what I discovered in, in researching his case was that he had once written a book, or Assisted, he was he was largely illiterate, but he had basically told his story to another gentleman who had uh, who had put it out as a book, uh, a very obscure book entitled "The Hand of Death." And what Henry claimed is that what looked like a series of random killings were actually basically contract killings that he was killing on behalf of a cult and that uh, his victims were in fact targeted for specific purposes and that his job basically was to make them look like random senseless killings when in fact many of them had specific motives and uh, around that same time I happened to uh, I think it was referred to me by someone or something that knew you know that I was delving into this research a copy of uh, Maury Terry's book, The Ultimate Evil, mm-hmm. which is a study, an alternative study of the Son of Sam case, David Berkowitz, in which he presents uh, very, uh, a very similar, similar scenario, which is that David Berkowitz was actually just one of many sons of Sam, and that he was acting on behalf of a cult of individuals, and that basically he became the fall guy to cover up the involvement of all these various other individuals and that led me to uh, uh, a book uh, The Family by Ed Sanders about the Manson case which Mm -hmm. had other parallels and then I stumbled upon a couple cases in Europe that had been reopened the the Monster of Florence case and uh, another one that I can't think of right now which had recently been reopened at at the time that I was doing this research because evidence had surfaced that uh, those killings were not the uh, the work of a single individual, but were in fact the, the work of a cult of individuals. So, you know, I started to realize that that you know there was a few too many of these cases floating about for them to be just sort of isolated cases. So I avidly dove into uh, the serial killer literature, so to speak, and started going through you know uh, the 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 uh, various books about uh, first, you know, most, uh, all the all of your standard high-profile guys that everybody knows, you know, the Ted Bundys, the John Wayne Gacy's, Jeffrey Dahmer's, Hillside Stranglers, and those led me to uh, to various other cases and uh, ended up researching, I don't know, some three dozen or so or maybe more individual uh, 
quote-unquote serial killer cases, and I found these same sort of common threads running through each of the stories. Uh, and what I, what I began to realize is that there was a completely different way of looking at this whole serial killer phenomenon than, than the way that, uh, you know, we are conditioned to to look at these people. Uh, was kind of a long answer. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> that's just funny. That's uh, that, that's basically how the book came about. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people were kind of surprised from it be by it because prior to that, my writings were I don't want to say mainstream, more mainstream, but they were not really as far off the beaten path as as this book took me. You know, uh, mm -hmm. which you know the threads running through that are, are ones of mind control and uh, you know uh, satanic cult and occult groups and. All this kind of weird stuff that, that's normally thought of as being kind of the province of, of right-wing conspiracy theorists, where I have always thought of myself as being solidly on the left. And so it caught a lot of my readers by surprise that I had what they thought was, you know, taking this kind of a change of direction. But, I mean, basically, I just... I just follow the trail wherever it leads. I'm not really afraid to venture, <laughs> you know, in any direction. A lot of what I find I consider to be disinformation and nonsense. But, uh, you know, the more I looked into the this, the more I realized that there was, you know, solid, uh, some pretty solid documentation of a lot of this stuff. But, and the book, by the way, is drawn for almost exclusively uh, from mainstream sources. This is not a book that's sourced to, you know, conspiracy dot posting on conspiracy.com or something like that, you know, mm -hmm. this, is all, this is all information culled from, from very mainstream books, magazine articles, newspaper articles, um, so it's my belief that you can get a pretty accurate picture of how the world operates from these sources, but it, I mean, it's all about... It's all about knowing how to read between the lines and sort of mine out the little nuggets of information and uh, and connecting the dots. It's really all about pattern recognition and recognizing how, how these these, these uh, sort of hidden themes run through uh, each of these individual stories. Um, what was your approach like uh, in the book? Did you go ahead and profile certain individuals? Did you approach it that way? Um, or is it a running narrative that... Uh, Start, you know, starts chronological and ends up, uh, you know, decades later. Um, no, I, there's uh, the organization of the book probably isn't the best. It's <laughs> kind of rambles off in various directions. There's just there's, there's like so much, so much information, so many different threads that you got that I tried to follow. Um, probably could have uh, used the services of an editor. Unfortunately, I didn't have one available. So I don't know that the book's really organized in any particular way. Right. Um, it's just uh, <laughs> there's a lot of information packed in there, and uh, uh, I, I don't know as far as, far as the org as far as how it, how it's organized. It's kind of um, I don't know. It, ma it makes sense to me. I don't know, maybe it doesn't make sense to some other people, but. Uh, uh, anyway. Oh, well, right now, I mean, I, I was just, I mean, obviously, I, I haven't uh, uh, availed myself of the book, but uh, again, this is a topic, and it's really, it's kind of, hmm, sounds nasty to use the word interesting, but you know, it is interesting, isn't it? It is interesting. Actually, the first section of the book, like the first, uh, I don't know, six chapters, I think, which are organized into the first section, are actually about uh, organized pedophilia. And uh, um, child pornography and uh, various things of that nature, and that sort of segues into the serial killer stuff because there there are very very clear parallels uh, between the two topics. They maybe not don't at first seem to be related, and some people are kind of surprised. They're like, "Wow, I'm like you know 80 pages into this book, and there's nothing about serial killers yet." Well, but it all kind of ties in uh, if, you, if you just sort of, uh, you know, stick with it through the end. It, it's, uh, becomes, it becomes pretty clear that, that, uh, that it's all sort of tied in. The book goes into even, like, uh, 
the uh, parallels between, for example, the John Benet Ramsey kidnapping mm. and the uh, so-called crime of the century kidnapping, uh, alleged kidnapping. I don't believe he ever was kidnapped, but anyway, the, of the uh, Lindbergh baby.
لوگ
I'd like to Much less skeptical. Mm -hmm. Fact is, so it was. But I'm not completely. Um, and that. it look
Kimga?
go with bizarre. was
magic word. Before that, they were, you know, very ice, very few and far between. You know, you had your Albert DeSalvo, you had your Jack the Ripper, and, and uh, you know, but they, they occurred, you know, Ed Gein in uh, Wisconsin or something like that back in, like, the 50s or something. Uh, but they were few and far between. Uh, they weren't, like, a, a part of our daily diet, so to speak, until, like, the late 60s and early 70s, and it really... It really sort of burst forth from San Francisco, which was, you know, not probably not coincidentally that in those days sort of a, uh, an MK Ultra city, sort of a, like the whole whole Haight Ashbury district, I think, was like an open air MK Ultra operation. Well, you know, the, no, the, hold it right there. That's interesting. You should say that. I agree with you, and I'm I'm going to bring something up a little bit later. Um, with regard to what's going on out there, uh, especially in and around Berkeley and such. Um, yeah, w did, did you find that that was a hotbed for a lot of, uh, shall we say, uh, cultural experimentation by the powers that be upon, you know, a segment of the population, which in that time would have been the flower children? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's where, you know, some of the original, you know, this, uh, what was this guy named? Something White, George White or something, oper operated this sort of safe house where they were, you know, experimenting using uh, prostitutes to drug people and whatnot. And, you know, I mean, there was all kinds, yeah, there was all kinds of, uh, yeah, all kinds of MK Ultra type stuff going on in that scene. And that is exactly where this sort of serial killer phenomenon worked. What I found, or, uh, kind of burst forth and what I found in my research is uh, and this is all in the book is that in this very short span of time just like a few years there were something like six high profile serial killers stalking that area in just a period of a few years you had Charles Manson who started out up there and then drifted down to LA you had the Zodiac Killer you had um, you had that big, this big guy what the hell was his name Big giant guy, I can't even remember. But uh, there was, there was, there was like uh, all together, there was like six. Incredible, really. And this was at a time when the serial killer phenomenon was so rare that we didn't even have a name for it yet. And yet, uh, this little tiny little, you know, geographic area, just a speck on the map, you had uh, literally six of these guys like operating pretty much simultaneously which is, you know, very, uh, statistically, I would think, is very highly unlikely. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, 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 I believe that the, the, the modern phenomenon really kind of, really kind of grew directly out of that, out of that city and the surrounding area, which was, as you say, just a, an absolute hotbed of, of uh, social engineering, so to speak. Yeah, uh, let me run this by you. One of the things I've been thinking about lately um, I, I guess probably prodded most, and that's a good verb to use when I say uh, about Hunter S. Thompson's death. Uh, and then looking back at Ken Kesey, the Murray Pranksters, LSD, Stanford Research Institute, you know where I'm going with this? I'm starting to wonder, oh, I'm, I'm beyond just starting to wonder, uh, that this whole, this whole movement, this whole free love, uh, drug stuff, was completely, completely uh, supported by whatever you want to call it, government, military ops. Uh, you know, the Sanford Research Institute has a certain, uh, shall we say, infamy that they share with Tavistock. And I don't know about Kesey, but, you know, Kesey obviously was a, a grad student at Stanford. You know what I'm saying? Now, I'm wondering if this whole thing wasn't just a wonderful, you know, ex just, I guess, organic thing that happened in society but whether or not these people wittingly or unwittingly were supported and this whole cultural shift, and it really was great. And I mean, you know, looking at me and my cohort at this point, you know, this section of the baby boomers, really uh, we don't have a whole lot to brag about uh, as far as uh, 
more or less crushing morals and, and, and other, another uh, taboo, supposedly, or breaking down the walls that allowed other taboos. So here's where I'm going with this. Uh, have you ever thought about this or done any research into it with looking at that whole orchestrated flower power thing and believing that, yes, in fact, it was orchestrated? I, I believe very firmly that it was. Yeah, I believe the whole thing was controlled, and that's, that was kind of a hard thing for me to come to grips with. Yep. As, uh, I actually sort of came of age in the 70s, but I always sort of considered myself a, a decade, you know, that I should have been born a decade sooner because I, you know, I've much more closely identified with the 60s, you know. I mean, when I was in college, I was, you know, my music selections were like the Doors and the Beatles. Uh-huh. Jefferson Airplane and all that. I mean, I, I always felt myself sort of a uh, a child of the '60s that came along ten years too late, you know. And my idols were, you know, Timothy Leary and Ken Kesey and you mm-hmm. know, Hoffman and, and you know Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin, all these kind of guys. And you know, I, I've come I've come around to a much different line of thought in you know maybe the last ten years or so. And yeah, it's very difficult for me to not believe that that the whole thing was was very much controlled and you know I, I believe very strongly that Leary was absolutely a, yes. an operative yes. and, and uh, all of his cohorts and uh, you know I learned a lot of people you know staunchly defend him uh, but I'm not one of those <laughs> and yeah I, I think that it was very 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 much a controlled movement very much I mean I I I look at Woodstock as sort of a, uh, an open air MK Ultra project, you know, where the, the, all this uh, free LSD was, I mean, just like thousands of hits of LSD, mostly bad LSD, was just circulating right. openly. And, you know, when does that happen? When do people go around giving away thousands of doses of, of some drug, you know? It's just. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, that whole scene in, in retrospect now, you know, many years after the fact and with much research under my belt, I view much, much differently than I did in my younger days, much differently. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have to be honest, I think, uh, and to realize that we thought it was happening as a result of, uh, like I said, some kind of organic process or perhaps even uh, a reaction to, which I think is really trite, Excuse, uh, realizing that um, we were living under the, you know, the nuclear bomb, where one button push could be, you know, the end of all of us. This nihilism, so to speak, that leads to like, you know, kind of like renegade behavior. But yeah, but uh, you know, so yeah, something was going on there. Um, yeah, but in the- I think there's lessons to be learned for people today, and mm-hmm. that yes. uh, you know, I mean, just just as the just as all the kids in the 60s, the hippies and the yippies and the flower children and, and whatnot, they all thought that they were rebelling against the system, working very much against the system. But to my mind, they were they, they were basically being controlled by the by the system. They were a you know a, a you know a dissident uh, movement that was very quickly brought under control and kept under control and I think that's very true today I think people that I think the the anarchist movement and the patriot movement uh, for example are very much controlled and Mm -hmm. same same thing and the people that are in those movements are are quite sincere and you know they're good people and they think they're doing the right thing but I think in many cases they are actually uh, whether they know it or not they're working to advance the very agenda that they think they're fighting against well, I'll tell you what, I can't believe you said that, uh, but in a short time to come, um, I've been heading that way anyway when you talk about even the Patriot Movement being something, of course, uh, we, we all get it about the Hegelian dialectic, but we never thought for a second that perhaps some of this, or perhaps most of it, uh, is to create and pull us into a Hegelian dialectic that we don't even know uh, we're part of. In fact, what it would be is a conspiracy amongst the conspiracy uh, researchers. Yeah, well, a lot, of, a lot of researchers, you know, they realize through, you know, their own research and readings that, uh, you know, our intelligence agencies routinely control opposition groups in other countries. You know, they control mm-hmm. both sides of the debate. And, and uh, I mean, if you want complete control, that's that's the only way to do it. you got to control all sides of the debate. you got to limit the parameters of the debate basically and you know they recognize that it's done in other countries well why why in the world wouldn't it be done here you know i mean it just mm-hmm. stands to reason if you know that if 
they're going to all that trouble everywhere else in the world, why wouldn't they do it here? Of course they would. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of people are seriously misled, and, they, you know, they may be quite sincere and quite passionate about what they're doing, but in many cases they are uh, they're working against their own interests and don't realize it. Uh, that's, I tell you what, that, if we can for another day, I'd like to talk to you about that without a doubt. Uh, but it's the old story that uh, as I watch nationalism start to really sweep across this country, and I'm, I'm trying to say to people, don't you understand, this is exactly what happened in pre-World War II Germany, and, and the whole idea is, and if you'll forgive me, but I mean, if you remember that little uh, segment from Spinal Tap, uh, which uh, when they're trying to explain about, you know, well, this this amp goes to 11. Do you remember that at all, David? Mm, okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. I don't want to sound too crazy, but it's just like, but it's America. And you're like, don't you? No, no. I know it's America, folks, but don't you understand it can happen here? And it's like, oh, no, no. This is America. Well, they don't America. get it. That's, I mean, that's one of the biggest impediments we face is that we are conditioned from birth to believe that this is America and nothing, nothing like that happens yep. here. You know, it happens elsewhere in the world, but, you know, certainly not here in America. We're immune to that kind of stuff, so, but uh, we're certainly not. <laughs> no. By any stretch of the imagination are we immune to that kind of stuff. And neither is the Patriot Movement uh, in any way, shape, or form. Um, Insulated, protected against, uh, invulnerable to uh, the same kind of um, handling. But like I said, for another time, and I thank you for bringing that up, but one last thing before uh, we have to go. With regard to what you've done in the book and all that you've seen from your research as you stand back, uh, throughout the decades, and then like you said, especially in the 60s, was there any kind of pattern that you found with frequency? In other words, did it rise at a certain time, a season, a year? any particular time through a decade? Did you find anything that showed you some kind of uh, plot line uh, through uh, the last 40 years? Um, no, well, I didn't really look at it in that regard. Okay. So, um, no, I mean, I, I can say is I didn't find that, but I didn't really look for it. So I don't know if there is some is there a pattern of that sort there. It just it, it didn't really cross my mind to look at it in that regard. I, I'll, I'll tell you this. We had... We have one still going on down here. And, th again, this is a little bit strange. Are you familiar with the case of Henry Boland? No, I'm not. But I do. Uh, my book does make note of the fact that the three states that uh, contribute more than, mm -hmm. far more than their fair uh, share of uh, serial killers are Texas, Florida, and California which are also just happen to be uh, areas where cult activity is mm -hmm. reported far more frequently than in other areas and also happen to be the three primary entrance point entry points for all for most of the illegal drugs entering this country and if you know if you look through these stories you'll definitely find uh, that those are common strands that serial killers kind of tend to follow the drug traffic you know they they the other covert operations run sort of hand in hand with uh, mm -hmm. serial killers, including uh, drug trafficking and even human trafficking. Mm -hmm. uh, they kind of follow the same corridor. So, um, yeah, your your state and my state play play uh, very prominent roles in the book. Yeah. You you guys have yeah you, you, you've had uh, the Gainesville Ripper. And That's yeah, Danny. Uh, yeah. Henry and uh, his partner and you know, Bundy, Bundy mm -hmm. was there for you know, all kinds of people, all kinds of them there and, and in my state and in Texas, uh, they just seemed to just sprout up everywhere. Uh, I want to say this about Boland. I mean, we moved down here, and I think he had just uh, been, I guess, indicted for the murder. But, you know, I, well, we've been down here like for 14 years, and this thing is the longest-running show. You know, uh, uh, judicially that I can think of. I mean, I've watched him age, and they still haven't been able to throw him into old Sparky. And that's another interesting situation. But again, as you well know, uh, Florida, because of the weather especially, uh, there's a lot of transients, a lot of easy pickings for people because obviously they're removed from their home or whatever, you know, from their home state. And it gets it's strange, but I will tell you also in the county in which I live, uh, this county leads the state in uh, unsolved murders because what has happened throughout time 
is that they will kill somebody, whether it's a whack job or not, and they bring them out into a good old rural Pasco County, and when the farmer goes out to cut his uh, field or go through his orange grove, guess what he finds? <laughs> so it's a, it's a really, really a grisly situation around here. Um, but before we go, again, uh, Dave McGowan, uh, you've, you've written three books. We're talking today about Program to Kill. You do have Understanding the F Word and Derailing Democracy. How can people uh, uh, order them, and how can they also find out more about the work you've done? Um, but- for the most part, the books, uh, your best bet is to get them from an online dealer. It's, they're not the kind of books that you're going to walk into a brick-and-mortar bookstore and see prominently on display. Oh, no. sure. <laughs> That's especially the second two. The first one, a little more so than, than the second two, because I actually had a real publisher for the first one, whereas the second two, I basically had to go the self-publishing route. Right. So, you know, the only the only surefire way of finding them is, you know, through Amazon or, uh, you know, one of the at barnesandnoble.com or, one, you know, one of the online sellers. You can pick up, pick up copies from any of those. First one's a little dated at this point. Uh, still some good information in there, but, you know, a lot of the world has really changed a lot since I think that book was released in, like, 99 or something, pre-911. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the world is kind of divided into pre and post 911 now. <laughs> uh-huh. So, uh, but it's still got some valuable information. But that, that's, you know, that's really your, your only, uh, sure bet for, for tracking the books down. And as far as getting in, additional information, there is, uh, you can spend many, many long days, uh, prowling through all the information on my website to get an idea of, you know, what I'm all about, and, you know, what my, uh, what my leanings are and my writing style and whatnot. I tend to inject a lot of humor, a lot of dark humor, black humor, uh, mm-hmm. on the principle that, uh, you know, a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down and all that. Mm-hmm. I, I tend to, de- to delve into very, very dark topics, those stuff that uh, a lot of people don't really want to even get involved in, and uh, so I try to sort of lighten the, lighten the load a little bit as much as possible with a little levity here and there. And, uh, you know, you can get a good taste of all of that from, from my website, and uh, you know, if you like what you find, then the books are out there. They may not be the easiest to find, but they are out there. Okay. Uh, if you will, Dave, stay with us. I'm going to bid the... Uh the audience, goodbye. Uh, folks, you will hear Dave tomorrow, uh, and we'll talk about Flight 93. We'll see you back then, and uh, have a good day. <laughs>